Um, and we, uh, so uh, we're going to turn now to Harris, who's going to offer us uh, Devar Torah, words of Torah. Um, uh, for those, uh, I don't think there's anyone on this call who doesn't know Harris, but uh, on the off chance that there's anyone who doesn't know Harris, um, Harris works professionally as a forensic accountant. He's been a member of BZBI for 35 years uh, and has, among many other things, served on our board and uh, led Shabbat and High Holiday services. An outspoken Zionist, Harris is recognized locally and across America as a leader of the pro-Israel movement. And among our community, he is known for his big heart and his ready willingness to lend a hand. And so it is with great pleasure, Harris, that we look to you for this morning's Devar Torah. Well, thank you for that. That was um, so kind. I, I actually, uh, on my screen now, have my notes up, so I, I can't see anybody. So if it, it's a perfect time to leave or laugh at me, if you prefer, um, because I can't see you anyway. <laughs> um, uh, at least for the next few minutes. So uh, thank you for that. Abe. So when Rabbi Abe asked me to do this week's uh, Devar, um, uh, you know, I was very honored. It's, an, you know, certainly an honor to, um, to uh, not just study Torah, but to actually lead, lead um, and, and actually uh, be the leader of such a discussion. So I was very honored. And he either implied, he, he, he said to me, um, you know, it's a double parsha. And I said, um, you know, I was thinking to myself, um, that's great, there's more potential topics for the Devar. Um, so I quickly looked up and saw that the double parsha, the first one is about a red heifer, and the second one's about a talking donkey. So I thought to myself, well, geez, thanks a lot. Um, and um, quite frankly, the thought that in recent weeks, there seems to be anywhere from five to 10 rabbis on our Zoom service, um, that did not exactly calm my nerves about uh, giving uh, this divorce. So uh, 15 years ago, and it's incredible to me to think that it was that 15 years have gone by, but my younger daughter, Rachel, whom many people uh, on this uh, Zoom service uh, know, um, it was her bat mitzvah, um, if you can believe that. And it was Shabbat Parah. Um, and on Shabbat Parah, we read, uh, in essence, the part I read, just the first part of uh, Chukat as um, the Maftir. Um, her bat mitzvah was actually in Parshat Shemini. Um, but anyway, I taught her her part, you may recall. Um, and I thought based on that connection in trying to choose between talking donkeys and red heifers, I would probably choose talking about the red heifer um, uh, because I had equally no understanding of uh, either, quite frankly. Um, so what to say about this, um, you know, based on my age and when I started to go to shul regularly when I was a kid, I estimate that I've probably been present for this Parsha um, 60 times and uh, perhaps really 120 times since it's read twice a year. And after 120 times, I still have no idea what it means um, after all those times of hearing it and reading it. But I decided that I've always loved studying Rashi, uh, Rashi's commentary. Uh, so I thought that maybe we would take a look on this red, his take on this red heifer business. And not surprisingly, though, I had to read that and other contributory sources numerous times. I wasn't disappointed by his take on it, especially <clears throat> since at the end of the day, he, at its most basic level, doesn't understand it either. Um, so just, um, you know, Rashi, for those who don't know, and I'm sure there are very few who don't know, but um, Rashi is probably the most widely studied commentary on the Chumash, on the Torah. Um, there are many comments of Rashi that are well known and widely quoted. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, these comments are quoted so frequently that we neglect to really consider them carefully. Um, 
as soon as we hear the beginning of Rashi's comment, we almost finish the quote in our minds and do not even think carefully about what is really Rashi getting to and what's his observation. <clears throat> the first comment of Rashi on this week's Parsha is one of those often quoted texts, which probably requires, no, not probably, does require more attention than it normally receives. So we're gonna look at that. Um, but having said that, before considering it, let's first just look at the pasuk it is intended to interpret um, the first sentence uh, or so of para of the laws, introduces the laws of para duma, the red heifer. And I don't know if you have it in, you know, handy um, from this morning's Torah reading or not, I'll read it, um, just the first couple lines. Um, but we're only gonna focus on a couple words of it. So uh, even if you don't have it, you'll, you'll still hopefully get the benefit, if there is any benefit of this, of, of what um, we're gonna talk about. So it starts out, Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe V'yel Aaron Remor, and God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Aaron saying, Zot Chukat HaTorah, this, are the, this, this is the laws of the Torah, which God commanded saying, Daber el Bnei Yisrael, speak to the Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel, and take, they, that they should take for themselves a para aduma tamima, a perfect uh, or complete para cow or heifer, Aduma, red, a complete red heifer. Asher in ba'mum, which has no blemish. Asher lo ala aleha o, which has never been hooked up to a harness or a yoke. And then um, uh, it goes on uh, to talk about how the animal is slaughtered and completely burned. The ashes of the heifer with other ingredients are then used for a purification ceremony, most notably for a person who has been exposed to a deceased body and other severe forms of uh, what are known as spiritual defilement. So we're gonna really talk about two words in here, chukata Torah, um, only because Rashi's comments on, on this line are, are sort of motivated by those two words and sort of go to those two words. Um, so the, the passage, of course, which we just read, Chukat HaTorah, describes the mitzvah of this para aduma as a Chukat HaTorah. And in the translation we gave, it's been translated to mean the law of the Torah. Chukat is a law, Torah is, of course, the Torah. But this translation um, um, is really once you get into what Rashi uh, discusses, is an oversimplification of where Rashi is coming from. And quite frankly, you can't even understand where Rashi is coming from unless you understand the specific meanings of those words. So the, the first word, chok, or chukat, as in chukat, is widely used in the Hamash. Um, and it's generally in the, in the Torah, has three meanings. In most instances, it's used to identify the permanence of a mitzvah or law. In fact, the Torah clearly makes this connection by frequently using the term chok in the phrase chukat olam. I'm sure we've all you know, heard that phrase before. Olam, of course, means the world, um, but is also a word used to express infinity, or um, forever, permanent. So chukat olam is a permanent chuk. And where, the word, where this use of the word chukat is, uh, an example of that is when the Torah talks about the observance of Pesach, for instance. Um, pes, the laws, the observance and laws of Pesach is a chukat olam, a chuk for all generations. It's permanent. It, it communic the word chuk 
communicates that the, the laws are permanent. But in some cases, um, the word chok also refers in the Torah to a right or a portion assigned to a person or a group by some authority. For example, there was a chok in Joseph, Yosef's time, that the leaders of Egypt were awarded by Pharaoh a portion of land. Um, and it uses the word chok because there's a right or portion that is given to a group by some authority. Um, similarly, in a part we read several weeks ago in Acharemot, um, not in Acharemot, but um, where the deaths of, yeah, I guess it was Acharemot, in the, uh, the deaths of Nadav and Avihu, uh, Aaron's sons, Moshe instructs the remaining Kohanim that despite all this, they must still eat their chok, their portion from the sacrifices offered that day, because again, it's a right or portion assigned to the group by some authority. But there are instances in which neither of these translations are appropriate. Uh, in these cases, the term chok seems to communicate that the law is really a decree from Hashem. For example, in explaining the laws of Pesach Sheni, uh, a Pesach sacrifice, I'm sure most of us know what that is, brought by those who could not offer this sacrifice at its normal time, Moshe explains that the Pesach sacrifice must be offered according to all of its chukotav, according to its chok, that is, the decrees. In this instance, it's clear that the term chok does not mean portion, uh, as we described before. It doesn't seem to refer to permanence. Um, so therefore, it's translated in this case generally as just the word decree. So what is the meaning of the term chok in our passage? Clearly, it does not mean portion. And it's obvious, there's no obvious reason to assume that the term is a reference to any kind of permanence. Therefore, it's taken and Rashi uh, takes it to mean uh, decree. And now, um, before we get to talking about one word, one other word, and then drilling down to, uh, and then finally talking about what Rashi says, it's now possible to more accurately translate our pasuk as this is the decree of the Torah, zot hukat ha-Torah, decree of the Torah. However, the meaning and even the translation of this sentence is still more clear. There's another problem. What does the term Torah mean? The term Torah, of course, is used occasionally to refer to the entire corpus of law contained in the chupash, the whole 613 and, and all the things that come with it. But this isn't really the usual manner in which the term is used in the Torah. Generally, the term refers to a set of detailed laws regulating a specific process. So for instance, the Chumash introduces the laws regulating the offering of the Mincha sacrifice with the phrase, this is the Torah of the Mincha offering. So it's really talking about a set of detailed laws regulating a specific process. Um, so what does the term Torah mean in our case? It seems unlikely that the term refers to an entire corpus of law. If that were the reference, then the sentence would mean this is the decree of the entire Torah, implying that this is, um, this, there is only one single decree in the entire system of law, uh, and this happens to be it. Um, so that is really rejected because it's hard to believe that that's the case, and Rashi rejects it too. Um, so what does it refer to, the word Torah in here, and especially in the context of what it is? It is, according to Rashi's son, uh, grandson, Rashbam, who's also a famous commentator, it seems that the meaning of the passage is that there's an element within the laws of uh, purity and impurity, Tuman, Torah, 
that must be regarded as specifically a decree from Hashem. This element is the mitzvah regarding the parah duma. It raises an obvious question. Why is the mitzvah of parah duma singled out from all the other laws regulating Tuma and Tara and referred to solely as a decree uh, the, in with the use of the word uh, chukah? And that's the word that, and that's really what prompts Rashi's comments. And before we just get to Rashi's comments, one last thing. As um, explained above, the term chok has three alternative meanings. The term often communicates the permanence of a mitzvah, uh, as we talk about. Um, and sometimes it's, um, it, it refers to a portion or a right awarded by an authority. In other words, it means, uh, and, uh, and in, as in our passage, a third use would be as a decree. It's unlikely, it would seem, that the Torah would use one term in three completely different ways without some kind of common denominator between the three uses. And it seems that the term chok always makes reference to a law, be it a permanent law, be it a right or, or that's conveyed to somebody or just a decree that rests on authority. That's the common, um, uh, the common denominator. A law, of course, in our Torah is permanent because it comes from Hashem. A portion or right that is awarded by an authority derives its significance through um, the fact that it comes from Hashem. And a decree is, of course, a law that is based on the authority of Hashem. And that gives more meaning to our passage. This sentence is communicating that the mitzvah of parah duma is in some sense to be understood as resting on and dependent upon the lawgiver, in this case, Hashem. In other words, in describing this mitzvah as a decree, the Chumash is communicating that appreciation of the mitzvah of para aduma requires that we recognize the authority, Hashem, who has decreed it. But then what special characteristic of the mitzvah of parah duma demands this recognition? So now we're finally ready for Rashi's comments. Rashi explains that the Satan and the nations of the world taunt the Jewish people regarding this commandment. They ask, in quote, I quote Rashi, what kind of mitzvah is this and what is its reasons? Therefore, the Chumash tells us that it is a decree from Hashem. We are not permitted to cast suspicion upon it. It is clear from Rashi's comments that there's some odd element in the mitzvah of parah aduma that is destined to evoke ridicule. I would sarcastically say, really, you think? You know, the law is about a red cow? Um, you think that might evoke ridicule or is odd in some manner? Um, but to be more serious, what really is the element? A lot of commentaries suggest that this ridicule would focus on a specific odd law regarding the parah. Um, as has been explained, the, 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 the ashes of the uh, red heifer are used in the purification process of someone who is impure by virtue of being exposed to a corpse. Yet, so these ashes actually act to purify somebody. Yet, uh, the person who comes into contact with the ashes, makes the ashes, burns the red heifer, and handles the ashes, and I guess sprinkles it over the person uh, who's defiled, he himself is defiled. So it's, there's this uh, sort of um, paradox that the ashes that are the source of restoring purity themselves defile the person who originally handles them. But that doesn't seem to be the issue that really concerned Rashi. Rashi seems to base his comments on a text from the Talmud. In his commentary on that text, he explains um, 
more fully the difficulty of understanding this mitzvah of parah duma. He explains that parah duma is one of the commands in the Torah for which there is no apparent explanation or apparent benefit, as if we needed to be told. He explains that this characteristic evokes the criticism of Satan and the nations of the world. They argue that the Torah cannot possibly be true. How can the Torah be true if it commands us to perform its vote that have no apparent benefit? To this criticism, the Humash responds that these mitzvot are decrees from Hashem and rest upon his authority. So to summarize Rashi's comments, Torah alerts us that the mitzvah of paraduma is a decree. Rashi explains that this alert is important because this mitzvah is one of a group that have no apparent rationale or purpose. This characteristic will expose these commandments to criticism and ridicule. Satan and the nations of the world will challenge the truth of a system of law that includes commandments that have no apparent purpose. And we are to respond that these commandments are decrees from Hashem and therefore rest on his authority. Frankly, it seems a little unlikely that Satan and hostile nations of the world will be much impressed by that kind of argument. They obviously don't accept the yoke of Torah or revelation at Sinai. They um, yet were res told to respond to that disparagement with a reminder that the mitzvot are Hashem's decrees and that's why we have to follow. Again, Rashi's comments on the Talmud provide a clearer understanding of his intention. He explains that the term Satan, Satan, is really not how we picture it, or at least how I picture it, with a red person, or a red wearing a red cave uh, with horns and a tail, um, you know, surrounded by an inferno, um, but instead is a reference to the Yetzer Hara the um, evil impulse, for lack of a better word, um, our own evil inclination. In other words, Rashi's describing not a challenge from the outside to our laws, but describing an internal dialogue. The response is really, um, is not intended for the person that scoffs at revelation. Um, it's really to respond to our own internal when others criticize mitzvot like parah duma, that have no apparent reason, or, or when we ourselves are misled by our own internal desires, we are to remind ourselves that these seemingly arbitrary commandments are decrees from Hashem and rest on His authority. Still, Rashi's comments, and I'm coming to the end, so I hope there's somebody listening when I take down my notes. Um, Rashi's comments are difficult to fully understand. He's describing an internal debate that may take place with us, within us. But the nature of the debate remains clear. If a person is experiencing doubts about the truth of Torah, how will one be rescued with a reminder that these troubling mitzvot are Hashem's decrees? So, there's a rabbi from the 17th century, which is really the end of this, <clears throat> Rabbi Shlomo Ephraim ben Aaron Lunchitz, which probably the rabbis on this, uh, in this service have heard of. And his most famous work, his Torah commentary is called Kali Yakar. And uh, he's, I was not familiar with it, but in looking at sources, it took me back to it. And he served um, as the rabbi of Prague from uh, 1604 to 1619, so the very beginning of the 17th century. And he provides an important insight which sort of wraps this up. After quoting Rashi's comments, he explains that the criticism described by Rashi is not at all unreasonable. He explains, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have every reason to expect the mitzvot to make sense. The Chumash tells us that if we observe the commandments the nations of the world will admire us. They will praise us as a wise and understanding nation. This insight suggests a clearer understanding 
of the internal dialogue that's described by Rashi. Kli Akar suggests that we are to conduct ourselves in a way that demonstrates the deep wisdom of the Torah. However, this very obligation evokes a problem. How are we to conduct ourselves as intelligent and wise individuals if we're required to observe commandments that have no obvious meaning? It is natural to be troubled by this paradox. In fact, to not be concerned with this issue suggests that one is not committed to the obligation to conduct one's affairs intelligently. It is inevitable that a person who takes this obligation seriously will experience a deep level of confusion. How do we respond to it? Now let's consider the response, reconsider the response discussed by Rashi. There are two important marks of intelligence. First, it is incumbent upon us to try to understand and appreciate the wisdom of the mitzvot. We can't regard ourselves as wise, intelligent individuals if we close our minds to contemplation. But there's a second element of wisdom. We must have humility. True wisdom should generate a sense of humility. Humility demands that we recognize the limits of our own insight. A humble person recognizes that there are some mysteries that he cannot resolve. Just as there are elements of the created universe that defy human understanding, it is reasonable to assume that there may be elements of the revealed law, the Torah, that are not completely within human grasp. Therefore, by recognizing the source of the Torah, we, reckon, we resolve our confusion with the seemingly un, inability to understand this pasuk. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shakar. Shakar. Harris. Beautiful. Yashakar Harris. Thank you. Yashakar Harris. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for uh, challenging and inspiring words of Torah, um, as well as um, I think you know I, you had me when you started talking about uh, the the degree to which we don't fully appreciate Rashi's commentary, and I think it's always uh, a gift and a blessing to get to go deeper and to look really carefully at what Rashi offers us. So uh, thank you so much for offering us those words of Torah and for reading Torah earlier today as well. Thank you for the honor. I want to invite everyone now to um, turn to page 148 in Sidur Sim Shalom and to join me in the second paragraph in a prayer for those who serve our community. May God who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Bless this entire congregation, together with all holy congregations, them, their sons and daughters, their families, and all that is theirs, along with those who unite to establish synagogues for prayer, and those who enter them to pray, and those who give funds for heat and light, and wine for Kiddush and Havdalah, bread to the wayfarer and charity to the poor, and all who devotedly involve themselves with the needs of this community in the land of Israel. May the Holy One reward them, remove sickness from them, heal them and forgive their sins. May God bless them by making all their worthy endeavors prosper, as well as those of the entire people Israel. And let us say, Amen. We have a, a very special day this Shabbat um, in that it is not only uh, July 4th weekend, but it is in fact July 4th today on Shabbat. Um, and as I was thinking about that and thinking about the prayer for our country that we're about to offer, I've been thinking a lot about um, conversations that I've been a part of in recent weeks, exploring the ways in which America has failed to deliver on so many of its promises. Um, but I'm thinking about those promises and I'm thinking about, I think there's a way in which America's unfulfilled promises 
are the gift of this nation. Um, and what I mean by that is if we look at the, the monarchies and empires that came before America's Declaration of Independence was signed on, on this day across town, or across town from me, I suppose it's closer to some of you. You know, the, the, the divine right of kings didn't promise anything to anyone. Right? It was very transparent about what the structures of power were. Um, and, you know, if you were born into royalty, or if you were born into nobility, that was great for you. And if you were a peasant, you could expect to die a peasant, you know, penniless and downtrodden if plague didn't take you first. Um, and then you can think in contrast to uh, the, the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about um, Stalin or if you're talking about Hitler. Um, you know, I think Orwell summed it up well in 1984. Uh, they talk a good game, but they don't mean it. And I think, you know, very consciously knew that they weren't really working to advance the well-being of everyone, um, but were, it was feudalism by another name, right? It was the same old power structures and the same old games presented in different garb. And what I think sets America apart is the, the people who sat in Philadelphia and wrote that all men are created equal, and by that they meant that all human beings were created equal, or, or perhaps they didn't mean that, right, but we understand it to mean that all human beings are created equal. I don't think for a second they comprehended the actual implications of the kinds of things they were writing in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I don't think they could have anticipated that the United States Supreme Court was going to rule that any kind of employment discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender was unconstitutional. I, I mean, I think literally it would have broken their minds to think in those terms. But I absolutely believe that they meant the promises that they wrote down there. Even as they didn't understand what the full implications of those promises would come to mean over time. There was nothing cynical in that enterprise. There was nothing disingenuous in their insisting on democracy, on liberty as a basis for founding a free society. And so when we talk now about ongoing unfulfilled promises, when we talk about racial justice, when we talk about justice for the LGBTQ community, when we talk about equal pay for women, we're continuing that conversation, right? And we are in fact honoring the legacy of this country by actually taking the promises seriously and by continuing to believe and to trust that the authors of those promises really meant them, really meant them even though I seriously think they didn't understand the extent of what they were promising. They, they couldn't have seen the uses to which their words would be put in future generations and in our generation especially, but they meant it. And I think that when they look down from the other world and they see people taking to the streets to demand racial justice, I think when they see the highest court of the land guaranteeing fair treatment for all workers, I think they're proud of us. Right? Not that they saw this coming, not that even some of them might have wanted it for themselves, but they see us taking their promises as seriously as they took their promises. They see us meaning it as deeply as they meant it. 
And I think on this July 4th, that's our work. Our work is to continue to be as non-cynical, whatever that, whatever the word for that is, right? But our work is to continue to be serious about the promises of this country without cynicism, without dismissing them, without uh, a kind of um, nihilistic anger that just says, oh, it's all a waste. It's not. Because what has always set this country apart is that we believed in our promises. We believed in the American dream, even if it hasn't been available to everyone. We've still held that up as what it is to be in this country. And we need to keep holding that dream up. We need to keep lifting up the promises so that we can continue to work on delivering on them. Um, and so it's with that prayer that I'll invite everyone to join me in the prayer for our country, which is at the bottom of page 148. Our God and God of our ancestors, we ask your blessings for our country, for its government,